Um, it's, it's a, again, thanks for uh, surviving through lunch and the, and the network science meets the science of photography ordeal there. But we're here back again, and I'm going to try to keep you awake, and I hope you do the same, try to keep me awake up. <laughs> So as Peter mentioned that I've been working for way longer than I would like to confess on a book that is titled Some Assembly Required. As Peter was saying that I've been working for way longer than I'd like to admit on a book that is titled uh, Some Assembly Required. And uh, the book is basically focused on the fact that while there's a lot of work done on the science of teams that looks at how to make teams more effective from the time that they are, that from the time of their inception, there is relatively little work that is done on how the teams are assembled in the first, in the first place. And the session that we actually have here today between the pre my, my presentation and then Balash's presentation is uh, singularly focused on that aspect of it. So I think that this is, works well in, in terms of being uh, a, paired, a, a twin session in that sense. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the conceptual way in which I'm thinking about team assembly uh, and also a little bit about the sort of motivation for doing that. So some of you may have come across this, uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with the IBM Watson software? Okay. Uh, it turns out I've discovered now that this does not travel well internationally. So at least in the US most people do know about it. It's also difficult to explain that Watson uh, was very successful on the television show Jeopardy and, uh, and consistently managed to defeat several of the smartest people on the show. The person you're seeing is David Ferrucci and he was the guy at IBM. He's no longer there, but he was at IBM at the time <coughs> and he was in charge of, build, of, of, build, of the, managing the software team that built Watson. And obviously Watson is a technological wonder and there is no doubt that there's lots of interesting technology. There, if you ask it any question in natural language and it comes up with the accurate answer faster than most human beings do. Um, what was amazing though is that he wrote this article uh, about a, in, in a January of 2012, so almost two years ago, in which he said that building the team that built Watson was far more challenging than any of the technolo technological issues associated with it. I've had a chance to talk to David Perucci, and one of the things he tells us is that when he began this as a crazy idea, he would go to the smartest people at IBM and they would look at him like he's crazy. They were all working on interesting projects. Why would they want to leave what they were doing to come and start working with him on an idea that was a ragtag idea? He also faced the challenge where he would bring someone on the team and the next person he asked and he said, well, would you like to join the team? And they'd say, yes, and who else is on the team? A, and they go, oh my God, in that case, I'm definitely not joining the team. So there are all kinds of dynamics associated with people being brought together to join the team in the first place. And so part of what I think that points out to us is that we don't do as good a job as we can in terms of assembling teams, and we certainly haven't spent much time in the science of teams community in looking at how the assembly of the team and the strategies that you go through might impact both the processes within the team and the outcomes following the teams. There are also some other interesting uh, sort of uh, curiosities about teams that I think we don't spend much attention on. So before I go into a framework to talk about how one might want to think about assembly of a team and what we have known so far, I wanted to touch on a couple of other things. How many of you are familiar with the Battier effect? A couple of people are familiar with the Battier effect. And, the, and Battier, as many of you may know, it was, uh, uh, was a uh, major basketball player at uh, Jonathan Cummings uh, University at Duke for many years, very successful, went into the NBA. And when he got to the <coughs> NBA, everyone expected really wonderful things from this person. They thought he was going to have incredible statistics and so on and so forth. They consistently voted for him to be on all-star teams. But every now and then, there was an Emperor's New Clothes story which said, well, where are his stats? I mean, what is so great about this guy? Why do we think he's an all-star? on the team. And so Daryl Morey, who uh, got his uh, degree here at Northwestern and was the general manager of the Rockets, came up with this interesting statistic that finally revealed it all. It turns out that uh, Shane Battier doesn't have high points or rebounds or assists, any of those kinds of things. But what, he, what the statistic that is really important for him is that when he's on the team, on the court, I should say, when he's on the court, everyone else's stats are much better than when he's off the court. So it's a very interesting way of thinking about the ways in which we think about how different people add value to a team. Um, not surprisingly, uh, Shane Battier was recruited by the Miami Heat about three months before they won their first world championship in a long time uh, last year. And so he moved from there, and sure enough, till then, the Miami Heat had not won it, even though they had all these great players there. He shows up, they win it. This year again, 
Shane Battier does well, and they win it again. So there's something to be said about how we think about team assembly by not just looking at the statistics of the individuals, but their impact on other players of the team. There's another important assumption that we often make about teams, and that is we assume that we have a task and then decide what team we want to put together. And that this is, in fact, a flawed assumption that we, that's a very rational assumption, but one that we should challenge in many cases. The best example I can think of in this particular area is uh, the most, uh, looking at the most cited statistical papers of all time. Some of you who are in, familiar with regression may have heard of something called the Box-Cox statistic. How many, how many of you have heard of the Box-Cox statistic? Yes, this is a good audience for that. Well, this is in an article that talked about the most cited statistical papers. It turns out that the article about the Box-Cox statistic was the 19th most cited article of all time in stats. And the story about this article is quite interesting, and it was chronicled by De Groot in 1987 in a conversation with George Box, and it's, and it's basically the following story. George Box was the president of the American Statistical Association. Cox, Robert Cox, was the president of the Royal Statistical Society. At about the same time, they got along well, they were doing lots of different activities together, and as part of this, they became really good friends, and late one night, as the story goes, they were sitting with some other friends who said, hey, with names like Box and Cox, you surely have to write something together. <laughs> and sure enough, because they got along well, they said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. And in the sober morning that followed, they had said, okay, we agreed to write an article, but we have no idea what we're going to write it on. And then they came up with this idea, and which obviously ended up being the 19th most cited statistical paper. In fact, in many instances, we as individuals do engage in the fact that we like someone, or for some reason we decide that we're going to do a task before we actually uh, before a team, before the task is actually formed, etc. I think that given these sort of anecdotal backgrounds, we are now in a position to what I call a perfect storm, where because of four factors, we are in a really good position both to understand the assembly of teams and to enable the assembly of teams. As I said, my focus here is ending where most people's work on science of teams starts, which is from how to take a team and make it better, I'm thinking about how the team came about in the first place. The reason I think the four factors are important is one is that we have really uh, powerful theories that we've developed in the social sciences, in particular from, I would say, network science that talk about how we might be wanted, what are the motivations that we have for creating teams, and what are the consequences of those motivations. We have some very interesting methods, um, some of which are from, the, from network science, especially I'm thinking about inferential approaches such as the exponential random graph model, or the P-star techniques, but a host of other related techniques as well. For the first time, we have lots of data, thanks to devices like this, that allow us to be able to actually test our theories empirically, or alternatively, use the data that we have to be able to make recommendations, et cetera. And then finally, something I'm not gonna talk very much about is that we also have the computational infrastructure in order to be able to crunch these numbers in ways that we're not been able to do. In other words, as Brian said this morning, we now have the opportunity to take another sports metaphor to create something like a money ball to help, assembly, to help assemble the next Watson team. And one of the reasons this is made possible is because we have um, a new approach that has been brought into the social sciences that uh, Michael Macy, myself, and David Lazar and others have chronicled in this article in Science a few years ago where we talk about computational social science as a way of being able to analyze data at scale in ways that we had not been able to do previously. One word about what we can think of as team assembly. Most of the work that is done currently on team assembly um, is to be distinguished from team staffing. And in the HR literature, and the IO psych literature, they talk about team staffing, and most of what they focus on are how do you assign teams. The assumption is that the manager knows how to put these teams together, and they do it either on somewhat of an unstructured ad hoc basis, or they hope that they're doing it on a data-driven basis, but I'm hard-pressed to see how they have the data to make those logical, rational decisions on how to put these teams together. My interest is more along the lines on the left column where teams are self-organized because even in corporations and businesses, more and more teams are being self-organized and they're being done in an ad hoc fashion because of lack of data, though I hope that through things like Moneyball, they might be able to be done in a more data-driven fashion. What is the literature on team staffing telling us so far? The, sci the state of the science of team composition uh, is based on several meta-analysis. So what you see out there is uh, data that was actually compiled by a graduate student, uh, Amy Wax at, at Georgia Tech, who works with Leslie the Church, and they looked at eight meta-analyses on the effect of team composition on performance. And this was over, over a 13-year period. And the results are startlingly poor. It's simply the main result that comes out of this is says, put smart people in the team, they tend to perform better. 
Uh, collective intelligence goes a little further than that, but this is basically where the state of the science is in team composition. I want to make the argument in the balanced time that I have here that, in fact, team composition is only one of four levels at which we should understand team assembly. And that team composition is making the assumption that all you really need to worry about are th the members of the team as individuals that have certain attributes. Um, so I'm going to start with that. Just to give you a preview, I'm going to make the case that we may also want to look at a team not just as the ad collection of individuals, but as the in relationships that exist amongst these individuals. We may also want to see how a team forms and is influenced by certain characteristics of the task itself that might shape who might be interested in that. And then finally, and the one I, I'm personally most uh, excited and intrigued about because I think it's the least developed, is the idea that team assembly is in many ways shaped by the other teams we belong to and the other members of the other teams that they belong to. A lot of the research in the science of teams has made the assumption that for the sake of analytic uh, ease, that people belong only to one team and there's not much overlapping team this morning. Roger asked the question about what is the effect of overlapping teams. I think we have to face the empirical reality that Thinking about teams as isolated uh, um, silos is, um, is, is not a bug, it's a feature. In fact, looking at the ecosystems of teams might help us understand how well a team assembles and how well it performs. So I'll start with some examples in the balanced time I have here, looking first at teams and collection of individuals. For this, I'm going to look at some of the data that we've collected along with colleagues at USC, Illinois, and Minnesota on called the Virtual World Exploratory. And so this is data looking at online games. We're looking at the server side data from several games. Several of the folks in this room are, have actually been involved in this project at some level. The one I'm going to talk about in particular is EverQuest 2. And this is data from a server side. And it's data from that was collected during a game. For those not familiar with massively multiplayer online games, these are teams of people who come together to go kill monsters. They all have special characters. They could kill monsters as a single character. But in most cases, they would be more successful if they joined teams and the teams have certain qualities. We were interested in looking at combat groups within this. So how do the teams come together to kill these monsters? And so again, this is an example of computational social science in a sense, because in three weeks, we were looking at over 8,000 players in over 46,000 groups with 9 million combat records, the kind of data that traditionally team science, the science of teams has not been able to engage with. So our goal was to see what makes a group successful. We looked at group diversity. And what we found was that we took each of the characters and said, if a group has people who are fighters, these are offensive players, mages who are magicians, scouts who are defensive players, and priests who are like doctors because they heal other people, and we wanted to see to what extent that diversity would impact the performance of a team. And we also wanted to look at group members' cosmopolitan level, which is sort of not a network variable. It says, how many other groups did you belong to, and to what extent did that help you? Uh, we have nice performance measures in these groups because we can see the team, how many points they gain, how many monsters they kill, that's the NPC characters, how, many, how much level they gain, and a negative measure of performance, how often they got killed in the game because in these games you get killed and then you come back and live again in a short period of time. And so we had several control variables and what we basically found was that diversity helps the group to achieve more. But on all the positive measures of performance, the more diverse your group in terms of characters, the more likely you would be more successful. However, the, the, the flip was the, uh, that members being cosmopolitan, that is having members in your team who belong to other teams, may not make you more productive, but it prevents you from having depth. So it prevents you from a negative measure of performance. The notion being that you might get ideas from other teams that you belong to about how to help yourself, protect yourself, and be more, uh, in other words, protect yourself against death more so than you would in other cases. The, the second one I want to talk about is the relational level. And for this, we switch gears from virtual world to look at data from a site that is essentially a Facebook site for people who are nano geeks. It's called the Nano Hub. The Nano Hub is an NSF funded project where people who are interested in nanoscience come together to form teams uh, to do a variety of things instruction, research, but also software development teams. And in what I'm going to talk about here, we look specifically at teams that came together to form to develop nano, uh, software for nano simulations that people then came and ran on the site. So the nice thing is we were able to see not only which teams came together, but we could see how successful the software was they developed based on how many users they had, how much downloads, how much rating, and so on and so forth. And what we essentially found here was that in terms of relational influences, people who were from the same university were more likely to form teams. These are the, these are the statistics of the successful teams that had more than 250 users. This is the right-hand side is for the unsuccessful teams that had less than 250 users. 
There is a proclivity for people to form teams with others in the same university in both cases, but the effect is much stronger for unsuccessful teams. So the bottom line is, you form teams with other people from the same university, you're more likely to create unsuccessful software. The second one is you're more likely to create, to work with, on software with people with whom you co-author. We looked at the web of science data, very similar to what Brian was describing this morning. And we found that if people co-authored with one another, they were more likely to form teams. And in this case, it was true for both successful and unsuccessful teams. The second one was the citation one, that people in some cases did want to form teams with others who they cited. And you would think, well, this is a good thing because if I know what Andrea does and I, Andrea knows what I do, we cite each other and that would be a good way for us to work together. But what we find in the results is that those who form teams with others who they cited were more likely to actually develop unsuccessful software. And the notion here being that if you have two people who are citing each other, it means they're citing the same bodies of literature, <coughs> while if they're citing different bodies of literature, they're not likely to cite each other that much. So the bottom line is you're more likely to develop software if you don't cite each other. The third category then is what we call the multimodal network level. So here what we're looking at are the individuals and seeing to what extent are individuals likely to assemble in a team because of some characteristic of the task. And again, looking at the NanoHub example, the characteristic of the task that we were most interested in was whether the software being developed was open source software or closed source software. And what we found, in fact, was a result that appeared to be counterintuitive at first, and that is that people who were developing open source software, well, uh, who were interested in open source software, were less likely to join successful teams than unsuccessful teams. It's a negative significant, and this was a non-significant coefficient. Um, the people who run NanoHub, they have a conference where they have 2,000 groupies who show up, and I, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, they invited me to do a keynote about the research that I'm doing at their conference. It was held in Indianapolis. They call the conference Hubbub because it's NanoHub. And what they asked me, and I presented these results, and I said, I really don't understand why we have these results. And immediately, several of them, including the director of the center, said, well, of course, this is a testament to our academic incentive systems. Where in academia, we are not incented to go get, do work in open source software, and so open, the people who are interested in open source software are not inclined to, to work in that area because they get benefits from more closed source software because that's where they get their credits. So this is an interesting example of how policy implication can influence the assembly of a particular team. Moving right along, then the last one is to look at the, how the ecosystem level influences the assembly of a team. And here the basic argument is that teams don't form in a vacuum. If you think about all the other teams that are here in this particular graph, they are going to influence whether these four people in the center are going to get together. So think about our own experiences. We belong concurrently or previously to several other teams. And to what extent do those teams and our experience in those teams influence what is going to happen in the current team? So here I'm going to talk about data that we have collected from clinical and uh, uh, translational research teams at Northwestern University. Uh, we are one of uh, several uh, centers that have been funded through uh, the National Institutes of Health. And the idea is to move research from the, beds, from the bench, from the laboratory, and translate it to the bedside, which is the patient. And so what we looked at here, have, these individuals were asked, invited to submit proposals that were translational in nature. And so we looked at these proposals, and we looked at uh, several of these proposals and saw what were successful proposals, and then began to look at how the individual's prior experiences, so you take a proposal with four people, and then each of the four had written articles with you know, several other people and several other publications, and we looked at all of those publications, and we looked at all of the authors on those publications, and all the articles they had written with other people. So from a single proposal, we got an entire ecosystem of articles that went out three steps. The authors, the co-authors of the author, the co-authors of the co-authors of the author, and the co-authors of the co-authors of the co-authors of the author. So that was the ecosystem. So there are very large networks associated with it. And we basically were trying to ask three research questions. How does the presence of established key teams dominate the intellectual discourse? So if there is in the ecosystem one team that has done a lot of the work with, uh, with other teams, and there is one sort of prominent team, how likely is that to influence whether a new proposal will be written in the team? And what we basically found is the likelihood of people writing proposals in, air, in ecosystems that have already been dominated by one team is substantially lower than what you would expect, excepting if the team writing the proposal is the dominant team, obviously. So that was one, one finding that we had. The second one was, how does the coherence of the intellectual neighborhood impact the assembly of a successful team? So here, what we, how do we define coherence? We say, if you have a focal team, the team writing the proposal, and they have several of the teams 
that they have been on with co-authors and co-authors of their co-authors. If there isn't much overlap in that larger ecosystem, it means that each of these areas are siloed and they're not really overlapping much with each other, that would represent the lack of intellectual coherence because this area hasn't gelled, if you may. And so what we found, in fact, was that in ecosystems where there was a higher level of team interlock, and by team interlock I mean the overlap of members in teams, and there was a considerable amount of overlap, that that kind of an ecosystem was more likely to result in uh, people submitting proposals, because in some ways that area had been made legitimate. Um, and so that's in fact what we found, that as you have a large, large amount of coherence, you will see people interested in <coughs> writing proposals because they feel that there's a community that might validate what they've written. However, the last one said that if you look at the proposal and you look at the immediate neighborhood, not the intellectual larger neighborhood, but the immediate neighborhood of the proposal, in that case, you want there to be actually less overlap amongst the co-authors of your co-authors. And the reason for this is very similar to what Bert structural whole theory will talk about, which is basically saying that in order for your proposal to have unique ideas, you're better off by being parts of teams that don't have a lot of overlap with each other because each of them is bringing unique information to the table, etc. So basically, I would end perfect. So those are, those are examples of this. What I want to say is that one of the things I think is really important in this area, and maybe this is I'm reflecting my bias in now being uh, partially appointed in an engineering school is that we can take what our understanding is about enabling of team assembly and, you, and take it from understanding to enabling. So in other words, to go back to the notion of helping assemble the next Watson team. And so I'm gonna see if I could potentially show a demo of what we did in the case of this last experiment, the, North, the Northwestern uh, uh, Clinical and Translational Science Center. So we took all the members who belong to this, we took all their articles, all the co-authorships and citations amongst them, all the keywords from all of the articles, and we built a recommender system that says that if you look at each of these people, so these are all the people, so let's say <coughs> go down to Ping Zhu, who's a member at Northwestern, and we said, I want to form a team, I'm, I'm Ping Zhu, I want to form a team with someone who works in the area of brain. So as you begin to write it, you scroll down and you see all the keywords associated with brain. Let's just take brain by itself. Oh, sorry. Um, I know how to do this. I, like it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I know how to solve this problem. So, um, let's see if I can. Or maybe. Yes, I can. Thank you. Now, visible. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. So this is the. So this was the person Ping Shu. There's a whole list of people that we could see it from. But if I want to say I'm Ping Shu and I'm looking for a person who's an expert on brain. I'll, I'll type brain out, it'll give me all the keywords. I choose brain, I click on it, and then I say I can, I'm looking for either the most qualified person, a friend of a friend, um, different characteristics that you might want to choose to choose a teammate, or my favorite one, which is the I'm feeling lucky mode, <laughs> which basically says you take the model that we have built based upon prior research of what makes teams successful and use that algorithm to come up with the results. And if you look at it, basically hit recommend, and it's going to give you a list of people who could be potential teammates who meet whatever criteria you've chosen. Um, this thing is the resolution is a little off, but you see that there are people out here who are Mark Williams and so on that who would be recommended based upon the number of articles they've written, the number of citations they've gotten, etc. You could click on why, and it'll show a visualization of where you are with. Not visualization. If it works, it's going to show you Ping Zhu in the center and all the people that he's associated with. There you go. And so you could actually click on this link to say, I'm Ping Zhu. Um, I, I, they're recommending Mark Williams. Why are they recommending him? Who is this person? What article have I cited him for? And they say, these are publications by Ping Zhu that cited Mark Williams and gives you the names of those publications. You can go back and say, who is this guy? Can I know more about this person? And again, if you go here, it's going to bring up all the information that is available on the web for this person. So um, again, the main point here is that if you change the criteria and say I'm not interested in using uh, the, most, um, the most qualified person, but I'm interested in looking at, say, the person who's a friend of a friend, so you change the criteria here, and if you do it again, now you're going to get a different set of um, people there. There's no longer Mark Williams. Now you've got people like Julius Duval <coughs> and George Hornby, etc. So the bottom line is that what we have here are the first semblances of trying to see how we can find out from the social sciences what makes team assembly more effective and then use that in a way that 
perhaps in some ways is not that different from what Match.com and, e and eHarmony have done <laughs> in other contexts, but uh, to make it something that would be more valuable in assembly teams um, as we know it right now. So I showed you this demo, uh, the first one of these, and I will stop there, and uh, thank you for your time. We'll get the, phone, the uh, uh, microphone to you in just a second. Yeah. So, uh, so Nash, um, you know, what I see a real continuity between this book and your previous book with Peter in that the first book was about how, how ties form, and now the new book is about how teams form. Right. And one continuity is if we think of it, one way to, to reframe this is the first book is about network formation in a one mode network, yes. and now we have network formation in a two mode network. But, it, and, and when I talk to people about your book, the first book, I think the thing that we like most about it, or one of the things we like most about it, is that you have the micro foundations. You build your tie formation on the basis of an understanding of the cognitive, the behavioral, and the ecological mechanisms that lead to these ties being formed. Um, my question is, why abandon that framework in the second book, given that there, it seems like it's such a, a, a natural extension from one mode network tie formation to two mode network yeah. tie formation, but it, from your presentation, it seems like you're kind of going in a different direction. Did you find that it just doesn't extend out no, in the actually, way that it might in some way? So I, I had a conversation with a few. Now, actually, the slides that you're talking about are in this. They're hidden in this particular slide deck, the ones about the multi-theoretical, multi-level motivations. And in fact, I did make reference to it in the theory slide and I said that, if I go back to that slide, you'll see that I made reference to that particular thing. So no, I'm not abandoning that at all. I think my one conversation that I had with someone before to decide whether I wanted to include it, basically what I concluded will take too long for me to try to explain, it just to queue so long just to lay out the overview. So I, in the interest of time, I said it'll take too long for me to explain the MTML model. And for those who already know it, like you, great. And for those who don't, it's probably not gonna have enough impact to do that. So when I talk about the perfect storm, actually, You'll notice that I put that, that's what I put up there as the MTML model there. So that is in fact the motivation. <laughs> what I'm doing, Michael, here is two things. I'm saying those, as you pointed out, are theories that explain network formation. But when you want to look at teams, teams are not very well ex defined by single networks. Because, for example, if you have three people connected to each other, you can't tell by looking at the network whether those are pair, three pairs of two people who work together or a single pair, a, a single group of three people. So bimodal networks that go some of the way. Um, I think that the real important one here is the ecosystem approach shows that bimodal by itself doesn't work very well, because bimodal allows you to look at connections between people and teams, but then doesn't allow you to use connections within team members to explain it, or between teams. And so really, from a mathematical standpoint, I think it's hypergraphs that are most, at, most uh, appropriate for the study of teams, because a hyperedge doesn't just connect two people, it can connect one, two, three, four people. So I think that what I'm trying to do here is definitely build on the MTML model, but say that if you want to look at teams, just looking at network die formation by itself is not going to be enough. And so we want to look, so the, the organization that I'm looking right now, and you know, I'm open to so feedback, really am open to feedback on this, is that look at the attributes of the individual, look at the relations within the team, right? And so this also works, and look at the, and, and then, is the show here? Yeah, so you know, the work that you've done, which has been very valuable in looking at group capital, et cetera, but that's still looking at links in between the team and people outside the team, et cetera. But here what we're saying is we can go one step further and also look at the ecosystem of teams that are there. So all these same MTML mechanisms will apply, but at those different levels of analysis. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to address that. And I'd love to talk to you more about it. So a slight variation on what Michael is asking about. I'm also okay. curious if there's a distinction between the theoretical challenge of going from dyads to teams or from teams to the ecology versus the mathematics of actually computing statistically mm -hmm. what's going on yeah. in a dyad versus a team versus an ecosystem. Yes. And I know 
in my own work on scientific collaboration, I'm always struggling with what the best measure or way to capture a theoretical construct yeah. is. And so I feel like at a high level, you're like, for time or for whatever reason, yeah. not necessarily going into the nuance of how yeah. you would actually measure yeah. a theoretically valuable construct. Yeah, I, I think that that, I mean, I think there's a real uh, synergy and tension between how theory is going to push methodology and vice versa in this particular area. Uh, several of us in the networks community have been involved in a project that was funded by the Leverhulme Foundation in the UK called Multi-Level Network, uh, MNG, Multi-Level Network Model. And uh, basically, the Multi-Level Network Modeling Group, it's MNMG. And essentially, the challenge is, Jonathan, exactly, you say, well, I'd like to be able to do this, and how do I do it? So I, 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 there are, again, hidden slides, as you said correctly, mostly for the interest of time. But if you look at the, um, if, if you look at the ways, the general framework by which you would do something like this, and I'll just put this slide up there to give you an example of it. So remember I talked about the successful dominant teams and I just put the results and I didn't put any tables, et cetera. So this is an example of what you do. And this is how complicated it can get from a computational standpoint. You take that original, that, yeah, that Google proposal, you take the ecosystem of all the teams that are overlapping with them and their co-authors and co-authors. Then what you do is you then simulate that ecosystem that have that, in other words, simulate ecosystems that have, it's very similar to the ideas that Brian talked about this morning, with the same number of scientists or authors, each of whom have written the same number of articles, and the same number of articles by the same, in other words, take the articles then, same number of articles, but then also break down the articles by how many were written by two, three, four, and five, and six people, so that you have exactly the same profile. You generate 10,000 versions of that, and then what you're trying to do is to see whether the observed ecosystem has characteristics that are different from those. So it's a very, I mean, intuitively, it's a very standard approach that is used to create a null model based on random variations and then use it to be able to test a hypothesis. Um, some people would argue, well, have you co captured all the qualities? Would you want to go one step further? People who are P-star and ergon purists will say, you've not gone far enough. This is just going, you know, this is one step above what David Krakow did with Quap, but it doesn't take into account other things. So there is a nice tension in terms of how, how you can develop statistical models that will allow us to be more and more confident about these results. But this is an example of where you see the results that are based upon the simulation, which is in red, and then the results that is based upon the uh, observed group that is plotted against it. And each of these is for each a different team that was a different proposal. Woody. Nash, thanks. Um, there's a theme this morning from Brian's work to Anita's to yours about diversity, and it, the implicit underlying theory seems to be, in some sense, a very Bertian one of import-export. You're bringing things that other people don't have. Yeah. Um, if I may, let me play with your Shane Badier example, though. Um, because I think the critical question about him is whether he makes others better or he does work that others don't do. Um, and those are, it seems to me, very different phenomena. As soon as you said he made others better, we heard a grumbling down here, which is, wow, there's a real confound. It's LeBron James, the best basketball player <laughs> in the world. Um, but a better statistic for um, Shane Battier has been the one of what do the best scores on other teams score when he's on the floor, uh -huh. okay? Yes. And that he amazingly does not lower their scores. Mm -hmm. So at first you're thinking, huh, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. But he lowers the scores of everyone he's not guarding. Mm -hmm. All right? Because he's soaking up so much of the energy guarding the lead player, the other players right. don't have to yeah. spend as much time on defense and they can score more. Uh -huh. Okay, uh -huh. that's not import-export. No. All right, and I, I think we're really weak at theorizing yes. these kinds of differences yes. about yes. people on the yeah. No, so um, I, I, I think that's a really very point that's really well taken. And I think that part of the reason I bring it up is because it is provocative. And you're right, I don't think enough is done. And Daryl Morey is, is a data scientist. Yeah. He's a number cruncher. So the data, by the way, I mean, the, the, whatever grown, I didn't hear it from you, but I'm glad you heard it from there, is remember all of these uh, analytics that were done were prior to him going to Miami. So this was his work on all of these other teams. So LeBron was not in the picture when all of these uh, data were computed. But I think, putting your point, that is it because he's, he's actually adding something to make them better, or is it because he's doing other stuff 
that is getting allowing them, you know, sucking up other mm -hmm. energy. I think it's a really interesting point, and I, I would love us to see data sets where we can uh, be able to empirically look to see if this happens. I was talking to Heidi yesterday about some of the data that she has, where you look <laughs> at different teams to see at uh, different kinds of teams to see, in fact, if you have ways of measuring stats that are similar to the Battier effect, and then see if there are opportunities to tease out the reasons in a way that Daryl hasn't done with the data that he has here. I'll admit to, to the, the groan, uh, <laughs> because you attributed uh, the heat to, uh, to Shane. Oh, no, I didn't do that. Oh, my goodness, no. What I, what, okay, well, here's what I did. Sorry, no, I, 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 I see I'm trading on religion here, so I don't want to go there. <laughs> but what I'm going to say, what, what, the, the empirical fact is that LeBron had been there for one year. One year, yeah. One year, before, right. once in one, one year before, that's what, one year before, and then, okay. <laughs> it, it's part of the story, but I, I, I stand corrected. I stand, yes, I'm not going to go with that. That's precise. Nash, I think, you know, the debate of having structure goals in your local network versus yes. closure in the secondary network, and then Brian's work on vice versa, uh, in contrast to Ron's work. I mean, how does this paper, I mean, sort of taking more of uh, supporting in, in line with Ron or against, I and mean, sort of, you know, we're having contradictory findings, ignoring the fact that there are multiple levels of analysis here. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that... So this, this is data that comes only from science papers, okay? So one can make an argument that maybe some of the contradictory ideas are whether we're talking about teams that are more interested in exploring new ideas versus exploiting existing resources. As you well know, there's some of these results also have a curvilinear relationship about this issue. Um, I don't know whether we have enough, I, think I am not familiar with enough level data at the team level. See, because a lot of the work that's been done has been done looking at individuals and their structural holes and brokerage and closure. In a sense, this is looking at the same phenomena, but looking at the team level, right? And defining team interlock as the link between two teams based on overlapping members. The argument is that if you have teams that are connected to other team members through overlapping members, they might bring new ideas into your team, and that gives your team some kind of an advantage in doing so. Um, I, my guess is that at the end of the day, we will see some of the same kind of curvilinear relationships that we've seen at the individual level. But I, I don't have a good theoretical explanation for that. So if you have some suggestions, I would, you or others might have it, I would love to, to hear a little bit more about those issues. As, as always, I love the, the, the talk. But there's a piece missing, and I'm wondering if it's deliberate or it's just that you've got so many things to, to deal with. And that's role differentiation within the team. Um, the, the team stuff that's coming up is taking advantage of network metrics, but then it's homogenizing them. Yeah. The team is characterized one way or another. And the slap in the face to me that said, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that, is looking at uh, doctor networks in um, providing care for IBD patients. And across the U.S. I think it's okay, Ron. We finished with lunch. You can expand what <laughs> IBD stands for. Oh, mm -hmm. not inflammatory bowel disease. <laughs> and it, and it's, 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 uh, it's a chronic ailment, ailment. So, uh, like Crohn's, etc. Uh, so, the collaboration of people in multiple yeah. specialties yeah. is very important yeah. for remission rates. Right. Um, and what turned out to be the case is the leading hospitals all have this these evangelical doctors who right. are pushing QI, but the difference in the actual remission rates isn't having those people, it's not the, the, the brokers. It's, did the broker build a congregation behind it? Mm -hmm. uh, did he bring people together so that they're reinforcing one another and implementing this? So, I mean, it goes uh, way back to the Levitt e experiments where you do really well in the group when there's a leader, but that doesn't cut it at all. Uh, it's, that just gets you in the set that might do well. It's the closure around the other people. Yeah. Now, that seems like something that would yeah. be likely in, in Brian's sure. uh, earlier stuff, yeah. in, his, in his Broadway yeah. stuff, or yeah. in, in this situation. But it isn't coming up. It, it is. is prominent in the old 50s it is. small group work. That's a really good point. I, and, um, so uh, conceptually, I think that's very rich. I know that there's a little bit of work uh, that I've now become more familiar with uh, in terms of leadership within networks and looking at leadership as often in networks, and they point that it is a distributed leadership, it's not a single leader. Um, I've dabbled a little bit myself, and I think that that might come closest, though I think maybe Leslie's gonna, I don't know whether you're gonna talk about it today or not in your presentation. So that might be an avenue to do that. I think that part of the issue is in the kinds of computational kind of data that we were looking at, and this may be different than some of the other experimental studies we're doing, how do you get the data 
to test these? Would we ask people questions? How do you, in other words, if you say these, the leader has to have people rally around him or her, how does one measure you have the rally? In your data, it, it's just you compute the individual metrics, and then instead of homogenizing those people, you'd look at the variation in the metrics, you'd look at the complementarity in the metrics. Uh, uh, and so you've got the data already. Yes. It's just, okay. That piece doesn't get looked at. That piece doesn't get looked at. Thank you, Ron. That's, yeah, I, that's very good. I like it. Thank you. And actually, this question follows nicely on the last two. <clears throat> because as I think about scientific teams, they feel very much like teams. But if I look at the video game, it feels like collaboration. And I don't know if to you the two words mean different things. I know the team's literature has spent a lot of time thinking about what a team is or not. How are you conceiving of, of the definition of team within this work? It, it, I took it's a very naive definition, which I, I'm intimidated. You know, the network science meets the science of teams. I'm, I'm skewed a little bit more towards the first of those. But given all the folks in the room, I'd say my main assumption here is that the team is defined as a bunch of people who come together towards some kind of a collective goal. And to that extent, the online games is a team. In fact, some people, well, I've had a former student of mine, Brian Keegan, who created, who defined the team as the people who have all collectively edited a Wikipedia page. And one can argue that maybe that's not really a team because these people didn't necessarily, you know, in a concerted fashion do it, but in a sense they did because they all edited one another's issues. So. Um, let me just say, Ethan, I have a rather expansive view of teams. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to comment uh, after Ron's comment, because I think that's really important, right? I mean, one of the challenges, not being a network researcher, but a multi-level researcher, is that a lot of the um, treatment of individual level data that we want to treat collectively is simply to average it up, right? And the standards to do that are extremely is an extremely low bar. So it's a fiction in many times that we have real, true collective horoscopes. But the side that doesn't get explored in that literature, and apparently not so much in the networks literature, are these, the, this pattern of how the expertise or the role or the specific tasks that are being performed. So it's more about that pattern of configuration. You get some of that in the network. But if it is, in fact, getting averaged, then the uniqueness that individuals bring gets Lost. So if, I could if there's a way to capture over. that, because yeah. it's the same problem that teams researchers face. Those of us who are interested in looking at those patterns, and particularly the dynamics of how those patterns unfold over time and really make a difference for our team effectiveness, we, we haven't cracked the methods. We're, we're trying. But it seems to me the network science is closer to cracking the methods, and it's a little surprising that maybe it's not happening. So I, I, this is more of a question on my part. I'm intrigued. Ron, Ron it's, 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 it's I don't <coughs> very uh, and I was struck in looking at the Levitt results uh, where he, so this is 1951, yeah. way back in the world. Um, uh, and they have data in his dissertation that wasn't in the publication of the evolution of leaders emerging uh, in these informal um, uh, organizations as, as a function of what kind of network they were assigned to. So if you can believe that people in a particular form of relations will have certain advantages. Usually they're recombinant information advantages if you're a broker and it's deep expertise if you're inside a closed network or social norms of enforcement. Then the interesting piece becomes how do these network patterns change over the life of the team? And as long as you can make the individual association of patterns associated with kinds of activity, now we can study how the patterns change over time and make inferences about that activity. Because it'll be hard to get the data on the activity, but you can get data on the evolution of the positions inside. Am I articulate? Do you, yeah. Do you follow I, me? I think, I think so. <laughs> That's good enough. So now she will give you 30 seconds to... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 just, I, I need less than 30 seconds. I just love it that here I spend all this time trying to talk about how we can do things in the future. And Ron would remind us that what we really need to do is go back and read something from the 1950s again. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good lesson for all of us.